Island Secretary joins us. Good morning to you. Good morning. It's lovely to be uh, with you. I, want, I like to start nice. So we've got somewhere to go. <laughs> Peter. Okay. No, let, let, lots to race through. So let's let's talk first of all about what's happening with the Good Friday Agreement. Obviously, we had the anniversary Monday last week, the 25th anniversary of that uh, deal. Uh, and of course, we had the visit from Joe Biden. I mean, somewhat fleeting as it turned out to Northern Ireland. He spent quite a lot of time in pubs in the Republic of Ireland, but not so long uh, with certainly our Prime Minister Rishi Sunak and others in Northern Ireland. Um, but um, Rishi Sunak, the Prime Minister, is going to be in Northern Ireland today and, and talking about about how it's time to fulfil the promise of the Good Friday Agreement. There's really this strong urge to get Stormont Agreement back up and running, to get Stormont Assembly and the government back up and running. What needs to be done, Peter? Oh, thanks. I mean, the, 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 the thing we need to do is just firstly acknowledge how remarkable the Good Friday Agreement was. I'm here at Queen's University in Belfast, where we're celebrating the achievements of that generation. But the, the one key uh, thing that it delivered was peace. Uh, and of course, peace has, has endured. We, the Good Friday Agreement ended a 30-year armed civil conflict, uh, and it, that peace has endured for the last 25 years. So that is a crucial thing to always bear in mind. The political institutions that were created from the Good Friday Agreement, of course, have been challenged over the years. They haven't been running for 40% 40, 40 uh, of the last 25 years, and they're not running right now. But what I think we need to do is look back at those core learnings, the lessons from that 25-year-ago period, the Good Friday Agreement, period because our generation has been given the thing that they never had and that's the handbook to how make how, how to make politics work in Northern Ireland to get progress so first and foremost uh, we need to make sure that we can uh, get the, the relationship between the Irish government and the UK government working really, really well. Secondly, we need to re, 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 rethink that, that, that relationship between negotiation, get the art of negotiation back again. We need to get all parties back into the room and we need to persist with those discussions, talks and negotiations uh, because that's what they did back then. And then finally, we've got to get back to the role where the UK government plays the honest broker role for Northern Ireland. That means that we telegraph in from Northern Ireland into Westminster and we never disrupt politics in Northern Ireland from Westminster. And I'm afraid that too often in recent years, we've seen disruptive policy making and actions by people in Westminster that have had a negative impact on Northern Ireland. If we can get those things ready, right, and then one a couple of other key policy issues that the DUP are demanding, I think we can get things up and running, yeah. but then focus on the long-term um, stability the key, Northern Ireland needs. The key thing, isn't it, that the norm is now, that, you know, that the, the people don't resort to the balaclava of men with the guns. And that, that is a crucial thing, and that it is about talking, getting people around the table. I mean, we certainly all wish for that, certainly for the people of Northern Ireland, for democracy generally. Can we talk a little bit more genuinely now about some um, Labour policies, though, um, especially in relation to inflation? With latest inflation figures out at uh, 7 o'clock this morning, uh, consumer price index and uh, inflation at 10.1%, yep, down from 10.4% the month before, uh, but still stubbornly above that double figure mark. That will certainly have disappointed uh, the government. But, I mean, we know that it's people who are on the lowest incomes who are the hardest hit. They spend more of their money on necessities like energy and food, which have seen a much higher inflation rate. If you were in government right now, what would Labour be doing to bring that inflation rate down? Uh, it's a great question, Julia. And if you look back to last summer when the Labour Party announced its cost of living package uh, that uh, used the proceeds of a windfall tax on North Sea oil uh, and gas producers to hold down at the, at the summer prices of energy, in international, uh, external and independent uh, economists said that that would have reduced inflation by 4%. Now, of course, we didn't see that happening, and we've seen the, uh, inflation getting out of hand. So right the way through this, we've had policies that would suppress the costs which are impacting individuals, but simultaneously tackle the inflation challenge that we've had. So right now, we need to focus again on the cost of living because it's still a huge challenge. Just yesterday, we had figures out saying that the, the real-term decline in people's wages has continued, and it's fallen again just yesterday. Today, we know that inflation is staying high. High. So government really needs to act to make sure that people have money in their pockets so they can spend in the economy. And you are absolutely right that it is people on lower incomes who are, who are paying the highest price. So what we want to do is to extend the uh, energy price cap, uh, the energy cap uh, that, that, that's uh, impacting people's uh, the cost of living challenge so profoundly, yep. extend that from April 
uh, for longer. So that the, we tru- can make the trouble sure is that, that that's a huge more. cost. One of the reasons why we're in such difficulties in, in government spending is because that huge amount of, of money that's been spent on that. And again, I'm, I'm not sure people could afford to, to you know, light and heat their homes without it. But again, it's still a huge cost. The trouble is, you, you, you've spent this, this windfall, this windfall tax on oil and gas giants. It's, it's trotted out for every single policy measure that you want to announce. I mean, it's about freezing energy bills. It, it's, going to, it's going to pay for cutting the fat on energy bills, um, creating an en- energy-intensive industry fund. Um, it's, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's about extending small business rates relief, you, you freezing council tax for a year, um, you, you, you supercharging home insulation, uh, freezing fuel duty. Every single thing you announce is always going to be funded by this windfall on oil and gas. I mean, you can't fund everything. You you can't run the entire running of government on a windfall tax on oil and gas companies. It's fantasy politics. Every announcement we have made has been fully costed and fully funded. Uh, the government has not implemented a proper windfall tax. Shell has not paid a single penny in windfall tax because when the government brought in a windfall tax, it put a back door in okay. to it, which meant that if you were reinvesting in new oil, yeah. They then don't you pay, didn't a penny. pay the infoil, uh, the windfall tax. So we have made sure that every single one of our policies is fully funded and fully costed. Uh, we know for a fact that if we had uh, a, a proper windfall tax, we would be able to extend the energy price cap so that we could we could keep make sure that energy prices for people are are kept lower than they are today. Because don't forget that if our if our plan had been implemented by the time we called for it, people would have paid. £500 less. That's £500 people could have had to spend on putting food on the plates. And that's also spending money in our real economy. Um, Uh, Our other cost, let me just say though, Julia, because we are fully funding all of our our, our policies. We want to make sure that we can cancel a non-dom tax break for the top 1%. That would mean that we could double the number of training places and tackle the problems in the NHS because of the staffing crisis. That would mean we're training 7,500 doctors and 10,000 nurses. Those are creating new jobs, great jobs in the NHS. But it also solves the economic challenges we have because you can't have a growing economy when you've got seven and a half million people waiting for treatment on the NHS. Well, indeed, I'm going to bring on, come on to that. Uh, Kiss Kiss Thomas, your boss, has done an interview in the Telegraph today saying that the NHS is broken under the Tories. Trouble with this is every single uh, general election we've ever gone into, we've had a Labour leader saying, you know, 24 hours to save the NHS, the NHS is broken under the Tories. I mean, we keep saying it, we keep hearing it. At the end of the day, there are tens and tens of billions of pounds of taxpayers' money more going into the NHS, but we don't see any benefit. What would Labour do differently from the Conservatives that would actually lead to some of that money actually delivering the sort of services that patients want and need? Well, we're, what we're going to be fighting the next election on is the economy, you know, primarily first and centre. This will be the first time in a long time that the Labour Party has chosen to fight a, 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 an election on the economy. In terms of the NHS and fixing it, you know, there are many tools that we have in our armoury for tackling the challenges in the NHS, and we want to make sure we use all of them. The government turned its back on targets, uh, and look what's happened. The, the government turned its back on sound uh, sort of management and then descended into very, very costly reforms, which took all the strategic thinking out of the NHS. We want to make sure we get that strategic thinking and planning okay. back into the NHS. All right, then just finally, talking of, um, of turning your back on sound policies. Um, well, so things like cancer treatment and access to GPs and then also A&E waiting times. We think that people and patients have a right to expect to be seen uh, at a certain time. But we will also make sure we solve the uh, the NHS staffing crisis, the fully funded plan that I've already uh, outlined. And we will also get back to solid long-term planning, uh, all the sort of things uh, about making sure that we're using the best of all sectors, the voluntary sector and the private sector, to make sure that patients' needs are put first. Oh, a lot, lot of, so lot of your activists won't mean... like that. I'm sorry, I did interrupt you then. I do apologise. I, I, th- I thought you I thought you, you'd, you'd finished because the sound went off in my ear. Apologies for that, Peter Carl. Just finally, very briefly, if you would, just got a couple of minutes left. Extinction Rebellion, they're in the news. They're planning four days of protests from Friday in London. They've issued an ultimatum to the government. By five o'clock on Monday, they have to agree to demands to set up a, uh, emergency citizens' assemblies to decide on the, you know, a green future of the country and end the search for new fossil fuels now. Um, you've virtually given in to their demands already, haven't you? Government, If you were in government, Labour policy would actually involve uh, having a ban on all new uh, fossil fuel uh, investigations and searches in the North Sea. I mean, I mean, would you sign up to Extinction Rebellion's plan? I, I, I wouldn't sign up to Extinction Rebellion because the Labour Party thinks independently 
We've come That's to these it. conclusions because what we want to do is to make sure we can transition our economy into a zero carbon economy, but by doing so, creating fantastic new jobs right up and down the country. I'm standing in Northern Ireland, a place that has a lot of deprivation, but we know we can tackle that deprivation by harnessing the huge sustainable uh, opportunities that are here, these incredible new opportunities for industries of the future, creating new jobs right the way yeah. through from I mean, but, but, to but, and builders, but, right the way through to science and R&D. It sounds, so well, it sounds wonderful, Peter, but if you have more expensive, unreliable, insecure fuel, no one gets richer and no one's lives are better. And that is what the Labour Party <clears> is promising with that pledge to end all all, all new uh, you know, so, so, uh, oil and gas not, not investment. True. It's not true, I'm afraid, Julia, because we're we also want to invest in a new generation of nuclear uh, fuel to get the base uh, fuel needs in there because the you can't do it. You, so you, you still need gas. There is no one in the energy field who doesn't know and absolutely 100% know that we still need gas and we'll need it for another 50 years. But you want to end up. What we're doing is having a solid transition plan. So we will establish you know, Great British Energy. And through that, we will invest in new renewables plus nuclear so that we have the baseline for. For, for energy you're going to import the we gas at great expense in, in and great insecurity and, and nationwide renewables so that we can have uh, energy security into the future which is also transitioning towards zero carbon we know we're going to have to get to zero carbon at some no, point we don't. it is in our no, it's, it's, it's within it's within our uh, it's within our abilities to decide when that is what we want to do is make sure that we're creating new jobs and industries right now that we can then <clears throat> turn into an export uh, opportunity for Britain because if we're not, <laughs> we're, we're importing the solar panels we're not and leading the on this, we will end turbines. up buying in this technology from others. Peter, I, I, God, I wish that was all true, but it's all abject nonsense and it's going to make people poorer, the people you claim to care about. Um, I would say exactly the same to the Tory government, who are pushing the same nonsense as well, by the way. Not party political. I think you're all insane. I really do. Peter Kyle, it's a pleasure to talk to you. I have to leave it there. I'm going to say, I use the word insane because it genuinely is. Uh, but uh, Shadow in Northern Ireland, Secretary Peter Kyle, it's great to have your company. 8.46 is the time. Up next, going to talk about the latest, well, trans, some non-madness going on. Uh, more from James here as well. This is Talk Breakfast.